Okay, so so we, we can begin. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's seminar. It's uh, really a great pleasure to have with us uh, Christos Vasilikos, a, a colleague for many years who has now uh, has now moved to uh, CNRS Lille, where he's a director of research. Christos is a uh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to uh, spend time telling you how great he is. We know that. Uh, awards and all sorts of uh, excellent work, uh, turbulence expert, and he's going to tell us today about interscale turbulence and then the transfers. Thank you, Dimitri. Let me see if this works. Uh, is it okay? Yes. Can you all, okay? And can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dimitri and Peter, for the invitation. I wish, I wish I could have been uh, there with you since uh, I spent uh, nearly 20 years at Imperial. That would be nice. But uh, anyway, that's how it's going to be. So my talk today is going to be on interscale turbulence energy transfers. Uh, there will be three parts. Actually, there will be four, part, four parts of the first four slides, which, which will be introductory. Uh, but uh, the second part will be on... Uh, work with uh, my ex postdoc Tatsuya Yasuda on special temporal intermediacy of the turbulent energy cascade. The, th the, the second part will be with my ex uh, postdoc Yi Zhu, who is now back in China, uh, on the energy cascade and the turbulent, non turbulent interface. And the last 20 slides will be work with Joshua Padakis and uh, Felipe Alves Portela, uh, who is now a postdoc and uh, was a student with us for a while. And, then a postdoc on the role of coherent structures and homogeneity in near field interscale energy transfers. So let me start with the uh, four slide introduction, if I may. So uh, the main cascade that we know of, uh, for, well, what we have studied a lot in the last 80 years in turbulence, in turbulence is the uh, Kolmogorov equilibrium cascade, which is a stationary cascade in the way that I will define in this slide. It's, uh, uh, derived for homogeneous turbulence and uh, a situation where the large scale energy input rate balances turbulence dissipation effectively instantaneously. So the equation I wrote here in black at the top is the time derivative of the kinetic energy in wave numbers larger than k. So this is now a homogeneous turbulence. You can define a different uh, uh, wave modes. You can do a Fourier transform, a Fourier analysis of this homogeneous or periodic turbulence. D by dt of the energy in wave numbers larger than k is equal to the rate with which energy is transferred uh, from wave numbers uh, smaller to larger than k. And in that case, this, uh, this pi is a positive number, minus the dissipation in wave numbers larger than k. Uh, the power input is assumed to be at smaller wave numbers and therefore doesn't appear in this particular equation, which has wave numbers where the power input is not present. The Kolmogorov equilibrium is basically this, this stationarity idea that uh, the time derivative of uh, the energy in the high enough wave numbers is much smaller than the dissipation. And this is equivalent to saying that this uh, transfer rate pi uh, is roughly equal to the dissipation. In fact, it is a dissipation if k is not too high. So if this Kolmogorov equilibrium could be extended to small wave numbers, as small as perhaps as the ones which characterize the, uh, the size of the largest eddies, uh, so-called eddies, then you, re you, uh, you obtain this equation, which is uh, in many books supposed to be one of the most important equations in turbulence, uh, turbulence theory modeling, uh, that dissipation scales like the kinetic energy of the three half divided by the integral scale for the size of the uh, largest eddies. And uh, so you, define, you, you introduce a constant C epsilon, which is supposed to be constant dependent of Reynolds number uh, and time. So uh, this cascade idea, excuse me, I go back one again, since, uh, actually I can use that, yeah. Since uh, at uh, over a range of wave numbers, this pi is roughly equal to epsilon, uh, the idea of Kolmogorov was that therefore, and Obukov, was therefore that uh, over this range of wave numbers, epsilon is the thing that really determines the spectrum. So the dimensional analysis gave them that kind of spectral uh, uh, form. 
which is very well known in turbulence and one of the main results, the five thirds actually, not the, this one, but the five thirds, which have been seen in experiments and simulations. And this is consistent with the dissipation scaling I just told you before, where the CSM is constant by the simple relation. Now, this is a nice, good and fine, and it's of course really the, the developed for homogeneous stationary turbulence. But uh, here I, I refer to one uh, reference who said that clearly, but of course uh, a lot of people know this. If this idea was limited only uh, to um, homogeneous and uh, stationary turbulence, it wouldn't take us very far. So usually uh, this idea has had a, a power because we applied it nearly everywhere to any turbulent flow. Uh, if I remove uh, the average of the time, so if I, for example, do a DNS, direct numerical simulation, of a forced periodic turbulence, so periodic, so I can Fourier, the analysis I did before can be, a, can, can be valid in, in principle. Um, I, I do a forced, so for example, I, I force my stokes with a forcing which is time independent, say. Uh, then, and if I do not average over time, and I follow how this dissipation constant, which I defined in the previous slides, changes with time, it follows this scaling here, where Ari lambda also changes with time. So this is the plot where for different viscosities, this is one viscosity, a higher viscosity, and the higher viscosity. So for the range of uh, global Reynolds numbers, or this inlet Reynolds number, initial Reynolds number here, REI, which I, I won't have time to say much about, you obtain this very nice scaling, which says that there is something there in terms of what happens for uh, non-stationary turbulence. In fact, this particular scaling law here has been found not only in DNS of forced periodic turbulence, uh, if we actually follow the, the fluctuations of it, but even in uh, freely decaying grid turbulence or turbulent wakes, it's found, but where time is replaced by the streamwise distance from the uh, wave generator or turbulent jets, even in the outer region of a turbulent boundary layer, uh, Nedis and Tabularis uh, claimed, sorry, what am I doing here? Uh, claim to have uh, found this scaling law. So basically, if you uh, uh, strip the averages of a time uh, or of a space, so I, I want to make clear that if now for this DNS of force periodic turbulence, I average over time and I therefore totally ignore the, the, the fluctuations, I retrieve the Kolmogorov theory I told you about before. Therefore, the, this gives me the, uh, and gave us the, uh, the, uh, uh, the motivation to uh, try to see how things behave if you do not necessarily average uh, in a way that is allowed by homogeneity or average by in a way that's allowed by stationarity. And therefore we went back to a, a different equation, not, uh, not the one in Fourier space, but in one in physical space, which is a, an equation which has been developed over the years from the initial common half equation developed in 39 and this equation here, I'm writing here, it was developed by Reginald Hill uh, in 2001, where now to see the energy in fluctuations over certain scales, we take this velocity difference delta u. So delta u is the velocity between the velocity at the centroid x plus vector r over t two minus the velocity centroid x minus r over two, same for the pressure. So you can define these two points, xi plus, x plus r over two and psi minus. And what you do, you write many stokes in at that point and this point is the difference and you actually derive this is not very difficult. And this is written in a, in a way that gives, for example, conservative forms for this term here, which represents, which, and we will see it more clearly later on, uh, a transfer uh, in, uh, across scales, an interscale transfer rate. And this will be the time derivative of something which represents the amount of energy you have in scales r and smaller, say. By the way, here I do not yet have any average yet at all. There is nothing. This is basically like a stops. Here I will have a, a, a transport in space, d by the xk. So this is turbulent transport. Here is a term which is pressure velocity, two diffusion terms two dissipation terms at the two points and the term which uh, uh, expresses the uh, power input because of the forcing I have. So that's the, that's the, is the equation we are going to use to study uh, the cascade, in particular this term here, in various circumstances where we don't necessarily have homogeneity or stationarity. So this is now again the same equation. Excuse me now, I haven't have, have defined everything. This pi is basically this term here. 
Um, so then this is transfer rate. This is the dissipation. This is the diffusion term. So I have now averaged over time and space. And therefore, terms like this one uh, have been averaged out by average over space, for example. Average over time, this is averaged out. This is averaged out. And I'm left only with these terms here. In this case, transfer average uh, is equal to minus dissipation, average uh, diffusion term, and the input, uh, power input. And also then we, or, we, uh, we average over all our orientation, so we can actually plot this as a function of the distance between the two points, uh, forgetting the orientation. So we don't need an assumption of, of isotropy, we just average over it. And this uh, magenta line, I think this is magenta, is uh, this interstate transfer rate here, that is dissipation. And you can see that indeed, perhaps if the Reynolds number was higher, here are in lambda for those who are, are, are uh, accustomed to are in lambda is about 170, uh, is perhaps not high enough, but Kolmogorov's theory would say that this line here would be roughly, would, would roughly go to one and become constant. This forcing, this is the forcing term would go to, to zero and be important very, at very high uh, scales. And all the other terms are, are, are actually averaging to zero. This diffusion term is only important at scales smaller than the Taylor micro scale here. And actually that we can prove mathematically. The Taylor micro scale is a, is a scale which uh, uh, depends both on the amount of energy you have in the turbulence and also on the viscosity. Actually, uh, for uh, homogeneous turbulence, it is really the average distance between stagnation points of the velocity fluctuation. So it's something like an average distance between eddies, if you want to call it that way. So it's, 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 it's a very meaningful length scale. And this usually the length scale where most of the interscale transfer happens, by the way. It is the, the length scale where most of the interscale, most of the interscale transfer happens is not actually one where you have no viscosity. Now, this was on average. If you remove these averages, you get this PDF for this very term here, where this A means that I have actually averaged over spheres so as to have a, a something which depends only on the radius uh, or, or the diameter of this uh, sphere in our space. And uh, this PDF for this interscale transfer rate uh, tells me, and you can do it for various uh, length scales R and so forth, tells me that uh, if I was not to consider all the events that are less likely than about 4 to 5% the most likely events, then I would miss 50% of the average interscale transfer rate. So even to actually get the average interscale transfer rate in a, in a turbulent uh, flow, you need to, you need to, uh, to uh, somehow know something about these fluctuations, these, these extreme events. Of course, the other side of the coin is that you cannot only rely on them. You also need, of course, the 50% in, in what is uh, most likely around zero. So this is basically what I just told you. And here I have a visualization, which is already 15 years old, uh, by uh, the uh, Japanese group, which did some of the biggest DNS uh, early on. And uh, it's an it's a, it's a, uh, expression, what I just wrote down with this PDF of the uh, intermittency you have both in space and time in the turbulent flow. Uh, these green things are vortex tubes, a lot of vorticity. There's also in a turbulent flow, and the higher the Reynolds number, the more this is going to be true, uh, regions where there's no vorticity at all, or very little. So you have this very, uh, uh, this very uh, intermittent behavior. Uh, but it's not only that it's intermittent and that is it. In fact, the various, the various fluctuations are correlated and perhaps, of course, uh, it's natural if you think of the Stokes equation. So here I have this AT term. This AT in the equation I showed you before, the common house uh, generalized equation by Hill. This AT is basically d by dt of delta u squared. It's a, it's a time derivative. And this T here is the transfer in space. And this pi here, or minus pi, is basically the transfer in scales. And this is given to you for different scales. Uh, smaller and smaller and smaller. And you see how all these things actually fluctuate in a very correlated way. When I average over space and time to obtain the Kolmogorov uh, picture uh, for homogeneous and, uh, and uh, stationary turbulence, I have uh, the, uh, the time dependent, the d by dt term and the d by dx terms, the transport in space, the time dependent term, average to zero. However, the fluctuations do not, of course, uh, disappear and they even correlate with uh, the. Uh, uh, with, with, with the actual cascade. 
So when we talk about intermittency, it's not simply a matter of saying, okay, it's intermittent. It's also actually that different terms are intermittent, which on the average, some of these terms on the average may not be present. And here is just a way to uh, show you uh, this in terms of uh, some uh, correlations, correlation coefficients. So for example, here, the, uh, this black triangles are the correlation between 80, 80 is basically the term that stems from this uh, in the common heart equation I showed before. Uh, so it's the time is a time dependent term. And that's a correlation with 80 and the transport in space minus the transport in scales. Uh, this is the correlation only with transport in space, for example. So these transports, these correlations are very strong, particularly strong, and therefore should not be neglected. And, uh, and, and I will not be talking about this today, uh, but uh, they actually reflect uh, something that we call sweeping the fact that uh, this term here tends to anti-align with this term there. And of course, this will, of course, uh, uh, have some impact, I guess, on, on the cascade and the way we understand it. Uh, this slide, the, this, this plot here is more the correlation now between the pressure term, the pressure velocity term, and, for example, uh, this uh, term here, say, which is the, the interscale transfer rate minus the tra transport in space. And again, you have a correlation of about 0 0.5. Now, that correlation uh, has its roots to uh, the non-locality of, of the pressure, the fact that the pressure uh, comes from a, a Poisson equation. Now, there is more to say about this, but I won't say much more about this. I will just give you some conclusions which will really uh, motivate the rest of the talk. Uh, so first of all, the equilibrium cascade that... Uh, we all know and love for, for now 80 years, is an average picture, picture valid for stationary homogeneous turbulence. It doesn't represent the highly fluctuating physical processes with, which it averages over. Uh, in fact, to emerge of the mean, it even requires the extreme highly fluctuating uh, events to, to be there as well. Now, this fluctuating picture is not just to say it's fluctuating. There are also correlations there, which uh, will have to be taken into account. And uh, if you want to know more about this, uh, there is actually ongoing PhD work in your department right now by Henry Clarsen, uh, who is a, a, student, a, a CDT student, uh, who uh, hopefully will be able to talk about this uh, uh, soon. Uh, but this gives you the motivation to go further and look at cascades in flows and regions of flows, which are highly inhomogeneous and all are steady. So in fact, it gives, it gives you the motivation to go all the way to the other extreme and say, okay, let me see at, uh, how the cascade behaves in very homogeneous and very unsteady situations. Basically, the terms cascade as I wrote here cannot be fully understood in a purely homogeneous stationary framework. And this is what we're realizing, that uh, perhaps over 80 years concentrating on this may have more or less stifled progress. So I start with uh, the study of uh, turbulent, not turbulent interface, and I'm using some DNS data, which were obtained in the paper by Derek et al. using uh, the uh, e-compact 3D code developed uh, partly at Imperial and partly uh, in Poitiers by Lézé, Sylvain Lézé, who joined Imperial in 2006, and, uh, and Derek Lamballé. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, I will not dwell on the details of, don't look at uh, of this particular uh, plane and so forth, the shape of it is not for today's talk, this was done for something different. Um, but this uh, uh, DNS data is DNS give us a wake, uh, which I show here in a plane. So this is now a plane uh, which is uh, normal to the streamwise uh, direction of the wake. So this now is a uh, vorticity, modulus of vorticity in the plane Zx. So the movement, the mean flow is normal to Zx in direction x. And uh, you can see here what people usually uh, identify as the turbulent, non-turbulent interface. So inside here, where you have colors, red, green, and yellow, you have uh, high vorticity, where you have blue, the vorticity is very small, uh, perhaps even vanishes vanish be small if you are far away. And the way that we usually, uh, people who work in this business, uh, uh, identify this interface is by calculating the area that is needed that, uh, where you have a threshold of, of entropy being larger than a certain value. So for example, if you look, take your threshold omega theta here, divided by omega max, so omega max will be at a given time the maximum entropy or vorticity in that particular plane, say. So uh, if you uh, take a value about here, you will, uh, be, uh, uh, you will be adding up all the areas somewhere inside here. 
Now, as you take smaller and smaller thresholds of entropy, you go further and further out. And then suddenly you find yourself not changing the area very much because all these entropies here, all these thresholds here are all within this white line. In fact, they are within about uh, uh, 20, uh, 10 to 20 Kolmogorov length scales. Excuse me, by the way, uh, this simulation has a resolution at this distance here, X over LB equals 60 of above the Kolmogorov length scale. LB is the size of the object uh, calculated as a square root of the area of the object. So we are, we are going to be using uh, this way of identifying this interface, more actually of identifying a isoestrophy uh, surface, uh, which uh, re represents the interface because it's within this white line. Uh, by the way, the Ari lambda is 60. It's, it's, it's not enormous, uh, but these simulations are not necessarily easy to, uh, easy to do, uh, particularly at higher enormous numbers, so that's, that's, that's what we get. So again, I'm going to use this equation here that I showed you before. And I will use it now, uh, again, naked, meaning without any averages, nothing. I will take delta u, the, the actual velocity field. I will not yet decompose mean flow plus fluctuations, even though the results I will show you about the TI and TI, if I was to look at only the fluctuating velocity field, the results I will show you now for the TI and TI uh, wouldn't be different. So I will concentrate attention on this term here, which is the term which uh, um, uh, expresses the, uh, the cascade, the interscale transfer, as opposed to this one, which is interspace transfer, if you like. So I rewrite it equals all the dots. The dot is all the other terms. So here the dots will be uh, the pressure velocity term. Uh, we will have the, the special transport, uh, diffusion, dissipation. Dy/dt is the time dependence of uh, time derivative of the of the energy uh, of a scale smaller than a certain length scale r plus this term here, which is supposed to, which uh, expresses the scale transfer rate. I define this energy here so as to have now a scalar R, which is the modulus of the vector R. And I do this by average, uh, integrating over the volume centered at the centroid between the two points separated by the vector R and averaging over the entire volume of diameter R. So this is just a way to, to simplify and, and make it absolutely clear uh, as well that we only look at, uh, at, uh, at the uh, fluctuating energy inside length scales smaller than R. And when you apply this uh, operator, say, on this equation and, uh, and apply uh, the theorem of, uh, of Gauss, you get something like this. So the time dependence, dependency of the energy in scales smaller than R, by the way, here I have divided by the volume of this, uh, of this, uh, of, of this V, of this, of this sphere, uh, just to make it uh, dimensionally correct and energy. Uh, uh, yes, particular. And uh, this dependency of this energy is uh, equal to an equation which has on this side, the interscale transfer term, which is now written in this form, with the omega, the solid angle. So now it's, uh, I'm basically integrating over a sphere of, uh, of, uh, of radius one, as it were. And delta u dot r is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the velocity difference along, along the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the distance which separates the two points divided by r. So this is, a, this is a universal time scale, and this is delta u squared, the amount of energy I have. So there's an easy way to interpret this. Uh, uh, local compression. Local compression is when the two velocities at the two points are uh, directed in such a way that delta u dot r is negative. And this would represent a local, a local forward cascade as it will make, uh, will lead to this dependency being positive and increasing. So the energy inside this volume of size r increasing. Local stretching, which is the situation where the two points are actually, the two points have velocities which uh, separate uh, the two points apart from each other. That is local stretching, it would represent local inverse cascade. And I would therefore from now on understand, uh, interpret cascade forward or inverse in terms of this local compression and this local stretching. Incompressibility, of course, implies that if I remove the theta u squared, this is zero. And therefore, you can see that you cannot have compression without stretching. Uh, it's not possible to have forward cascade without inverse cascade events in incompressible turbulence. And now in the uh, next slide, I will show you that the TNTI, the turbulent, not turbulent interface, in some sense orients uh, uh, these uh, local compression and stretching events. So the question I'm asking is, uh, should we expect 
at the interface, uh, the uh, uh, the relative motions to be locally compressive in the direction normal to the TNTI, and therefore perhaps locally stretching in the direction uh, tangent. Uh, particularly, perhaps if this may or may not uh, somehow uh, have something to do with the longevity of this uh, interface, uh, that alone uh, I think is, is a is a bit of a, a bit of a mystery. And then, what is the average sign of the interscale transfer of the TNTI? So I may find uh, uh, how this behaves for different orientations. Then I will have to integrate over all the orientations and say if it is actually on average cascading down the scales or up the scales. So I choose my omega theta, my threshold, my, my isoentropy. Uh, and I think I chose some, we chose somewhere here. And we select points. Now this is uh, too many words just to say that we select not any point on this iso surface, but points where if you take a line across it, you don't meet another fold because this would make things more complicated and this is actually what we are doing now. So I'm not choosing points, for example, here. Oh, sorry. So for example, here, if you can see this, I, I will choose points like this or like that. And therefore I will take one point here and one point here as the two points uh, across which uh, uh, I will look at, the, at, uh, at uh, compression or stretching. And I don't necessarily interpret my compression and stretching or the cascade in terms of eddies, whatever these eddies mean. Uh, so uh, just, this is what I wanted to say, that basically I'm, I, I will limit, I will not look at all, I, I more or less look at about something like 50% of all the possible interface, the ones that actually do not have folds uh, involved. And then I compute the angle uh, theta r between uh, the unit vector normal, the normal to the threshold, to the entropy threshold as a surface that I have chosen uh, at that point. And, and this angle theta r is basically the angle between this normal and the uh, unit vector, which is defined by the uh, vector between the two points that I have taken to actually sample uh, the cascade in the flow. And the angle phi r, which locates the projection of r on the local tangent plane normal to n. So I will then calculate these conditional averages. This one, which is the, uh, the, this, the term that appears in the, uh, in the interscale transfer term, uh, interscale transfer rate term. And this one here, which simply says whether we are compressing or, 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 or stretching on average uh, without saying what this does to the uh, energy here. And note that since I have an average of a phi r <clears throat> over this angle here, which locates the projection on the local tangent plane, Oh, too fast. Uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this term here, which is basically the interscale transfer rate in the equation for the uh, uh, interscale energy transfer, equals something like this, where the average now uh, takes into account an average of the time, conditional on where I'm on the interface, and also an average of the theta phi r. So this average of phi, phi r uh, is in, in, in included here, uh, <clears throat> and therefore, with the omega bar, you have just this. So from now on, I will plot this, which is what I really want uh, to uh, analyze my cell transfer, and will plot this to know if I am actually compressing or, or stretching on average. As a function of the distance from the uh, isosurface that uh, represents the interface uh, normal to it, and uh, a distance uh, tangent to it, which, as I, I remind you, has been averaged over uh, the angle phi. So here are the first results uh, for this. Uh, this is this uh, delta u dot r, which is compression or stretching, conditional on the points of the interface that I have chosen the way I told you. This magenta line separates between uh, negative values and positive values. So here I indeed have something which is compressing on average, and here something which is stretching on average. <clears throat> so indeed we have normal to the interface normal to this as a surface, something which is compressing on average, and in the tangent, something which is more like stretching on average. But when we look at the term which translates the stretching or compressing in the interscale transfer um, uh, term for the, uh, uh, for the energy, delta u dot r times delta ui squared, conditioned on the interface, then I indeed have a term here which is negative, therefore is stretching. But this negative is even here as well. So in the region where I'm on average compressing, the energy is still going down the scales as if it was actually thinking it's compressing. 
but not in an average sense, in a different sense, which we'll clarify in a minute. And when you are below this line, so when you are really in uh, 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 close to the tangent plane, then you begin to be stretching, and here you have a bona fide, uh, uh, something like a, a, a backward cascade, a cascade from small to large scales. So I want to see that with some more detail, this particular one here. And therefore, I write it in two terms. I say, well, this uh, uh, integrated transfer of uh, kinetic energy, delta u squared, is really the sum of uh, two kinetic energy. One is longitudinal kinetic energy, delta u dot r, so the energy of compressing or stretching, this one, and an energy which is actually a rotational energy. So I wanted to see whether the sign of this term, which doesn't quite follow the sign of the average stretching or compressing, comes mostly from the skewness of stretching and compressing or from something to do with rotation. And both these terms are, have exactly the same behavior as this term, as you saw before, plus the same kind of, uh, the same kind of overall values. So it's not, we cannot actually say that one or the other is, is the culprit for this behavior. So I'll take this and decompose even further. And here it is, decompose even further by using the correlation coefficient Conditional on being of the interface between delta u dot r hat, which is this term which says if I'm stretching or compressing, and L squared, where L is the angular momentum per unit mass of the fluid elements at the two points I'm considering with respect to the centroid. And therefore, the sign of this is also playing a role. And here is the sign, the sign of that. Normal to the, uh, to the interface is uh, actually negative, uh, particularly at scales not too large. By the way, the telemarker scale is about here. Um, and it's weakly negative nearly everywhere. That's the flatness to show you that actually uh, extreme events of compression uh, or, uh, or, or stretching become more and more likely as you go from normal to the interface to tangent to the interface. So here you even have values as, as large as eight. So now we have all the elements to explain what happens in the various angles that we looked at. This is the term conditional on the interface, uh, on the iso surface that we look at the interface, which says if I am cascading down the scales or up the scales. And it's equal to these three terms here. So to know the sign of that, I need to know the sign of, uh, of this term here, the skewness of this compression of, or stretching, the average of it, because this is positive, and the correlation between uh, the stretching or compression and the uh, angular momentum I described before. So in the region of the plane where theta r is below about 50 degrees, so uh, normal to the interface all the way to 50 degrees, all these signs are negative. So in this case, I have a cascade down the scales by compression, both because I have an average compression, which is both because I have, I'm skewed to towards average compression, and because I have a strong correlation between compressive modes and uh, compressive motions and the, uh, this angular momentum. Now, in this intermediate range, where what happens is the least obvious, between 50 degrees and 75 degrees, so not quite normal to the interface, not quite tangent, then <clears throat> what happens is different. Now, on average, you are, comp you are stretching, not compressing anymore. But you are skewed towards compressing. And the correlation between compression and the angular momentum remains sizable. And these effects appear to overwhelm the, uh, the average effect of the, uh, which is of, of stretching. And therefore, even, even though on average, it appears as if you are stretching and you would have thought that perhaps you have an inverse cascade, actually the overall, uh, it overall adds up to, uh, again, a forward a compressive cascade for these angles here. And if I now look at the final angles, which are closer to the tangent, in that case, the situation is, is simpler. I have that both the skew, I'm, I'm both now skewed towards uh, positive values of delta u, delta u dot r, so both skewed towards uh, 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 stretching motions. I have an average stretching motions, and I even keep still a small correlation here, which actually doesn't seem to have an important role anymore. So now, uh, basically, I am. Uh, cascading down the scales because I am both uh, stretching on average and also I'm skewed towards stretching. But this was a local analysis and I need to average over uh, all the angles to see what it gives me uh, on average and to answer the question, uh, at the interface, 
at the point of the interface which I chose where there are no uh, folds uh, uh, for the length scales I'm looking at, and actually I didn't say much about this, I look at the length scales from very small to nearly delta. Delta is about the width of the wake, uh, in this case of the distance uh, x over LB60 where I'm looking at. And uh, this you can show by some simple maths. This term is equal to this integral here. So it's enough to look at the sign of this divergence of the uh, interscale flux condition on the interface to see whether this whole thing will be positive or negative. And it turns out that it's actually nearly everywhere negative. So on average, uh, even though I have a part of the flow uh, of, of the interface where I may be cascading uh, uh, from small to large scales, on average, I'm cascading from large to small forward. So this is the average picture that uh, we have. Normal to the ISO surface, we have a compression and downscale transfer. Close to the tangent, we have a stretching and upscale transfer. And this region in between, we have downscale transfer, even though on average, uh, we are stretching. By the way, this term, this is a very homogeneous problem, as I said, and, and uh, also, of course, a non stationary. Uh, this term is one of the terms which play a role in the way that the energy of uh, particular scales uh, at a particular place in the flow uh, evolve. There are other terms which I wrote like little dots in the equation up, up there, which have to do with uh, interspace uh, inter transfer in space, transport, and so forth. These are the terms, by the way, if I, I think I realize now I forgot to plot this for you. The transport term is, is actually two times bigger than this. So actually, the, this happens in a situation where actually this transport, which is uh, even more sizable and also important. So just to say this, to say that, you know, the, uh, the, tran the, the transfer is not the only thing happening, uh, but it's on average uh, going from large to small scales. Now, this is work with uh, George Papadakis. This is the last 20 slides. Uh, on a turbulent plane awake at the Reynolds number of about uh, 4,000, uh, it's a very different code now, Pandaria code. It's, it's, it's actually a finite volume code that George wrote. It's, it's work with Felipe Alves Portela. Um, the paper was published a few months ago. Uh, this, uh, so just to give you some uh, uh, pointers, uh, X1 is the direction of the, of the mean flow, uh, as you can see here. Uh, this, is the, this is the span wise direction. Um, so you will have uh, periodic conditions up here and here. Uh, if you look in X1, X2, this is X1, X2. This is the flow which is actually quite energetic near uh, the, uh, the square prism. This is a square prism, what people call a square cylinder, uh, or half of it anyway. And uh, this is the amount of energy you have. So quite a, high, a lot of energy here, a bit less energy here. Very homogeneous. We're going to look at distances between X1 over D1 and X1 over D8. So the near field. So we are really going where things are inhomogeneous. Uh, we are not trying to go as people have been, we, ha we have all been trying to go very far away with the hope to have something homogeneous and well behaved and so forth. Um, so let me show you more about this. Now, these are the spectra, the frequency spectra at points one, two, three, four. So we just take frequency spectra uh, and uh, we show that uh, they have a behavior which is close to the minus five thirds. Mind you, this is a frequency, the five thirds of Kolmogorov is actually in wave number. Uh, so that's sort of, there's sort of an issue, but it's interesting that we find five thirds. Uh, perhaps many five thirds have been found in many experiments may not necessarily be Kolmogorov. There's something else there, which I'm not quite sure what it is yet. And this is at X1 over D equals one, two, three, as we go further and further away. In fact, as you go further and further away, you lose a bit of five thirds. The five thirds is the best at about X1 over D equal two. Anyway, that's not very important. Just to say that we have a range of scales, it does look turbulent, and we also have here a peak because there's some shedding. Uh, this is not something that will concern us, it has to do with the bistability of the flow. But uh, there is some shedding and uh, this peak is there because of the shedding. We're going to talk about the shedding uh, in a few minutes. And now I'm going to use again the equation I had before, but now I, uh, there's a little twist. I'm using the Reynolds decomposition. So now I'm using big U, which is the mean flow, plus small U, which is now the fluctuating velocity. And delta Q squared now is the energy in the fluctuations. Delta UI is UI at one point, minus UI at the other point. So this term here is basically a mean advection in the direction of the flow of the mean energy in scales smaller than R. 
uh, this will be in a frame moving with this uh, with this mean velocity, something like a non-stationarity if you want. This is the term which uh, uh, expresses the interscale transfer, the, the, the loss of uh, or gain of energy at those scales because of, uh, of cascade, the nonlinear term effectively. This is now a term which expresses uh, the, the move of energy from one scale to the other because of the velocity differences in the mean flow. Uh, since we think in terms of uh, stretching and compression, the mean can also do stretching and compression. These two terms here, this one and that one together, are actually production terms, uh, terms which uh, uh, create uh, turbulence by interactions between the mean flow and, the, and some kind of generalized Reynolds stresses, which are correlations between velocity differences or and velocity differences and velocity sums. This is the transport in space, a special transport. This is the velocity pressure term. These are two diffusion terms, and they are small actually for scales uh, uh, larger than the Michael scale, so we won't talk much about them. And these are the two dissipation terms of the two points we're looking at, the two points which uh, we are using to sample different scales in the turbulence. And we are going to uh, talk about uh, orientation average quantities. Uh, of course, this is a, not a two-dimensional flow. It's a planar. It's a planar wake, but it's of course not two-dimensional, particularly not the turbulence. But we're going to, uh, for, for simplicity, and also because we had done before uh, an experiment in PIV uh, in the lab where we had done this, uh, but for a different flow. Anyway, um, I will take my quantities and average out uh, the angles in the x two x one plane in the plane of the mean flow um, in, in this way. And for example, here I give you uh, the uh, interscale the transfer rate uh, in terms of the compression stretching and the delta Q squared. This A here means that I have done this average, and here it is uh, for different uh, distances from the uh, from the uh, from this prism two six four eight. In all cases, uh, except here, uh, it's negative and therefore uh, indicates uh, on average forward cascades to smaller scales. I, I, I must uh, say here, I'm limiting myself to R1, R2. I take R3 to be zero here. And of course, that's something that we are looking at now. Uh, so uh, it is a limited view of things. And this is now the orientation average uh, equation that we had before. And, let's, uh, and, and you'll see that, uh, and this is taken at x1 of the d equals two. So if you allow me, excuse me, uh, we are about here. On the center line, so very close uh, to to the object, fully non uh, isotropic, non non uh, homogeneous. Uh, everything is non. Um, this now, all the terms are alive. It's not a situation like Almogorov who can say, "Well, uh, we are stationary. There is no time dependence. We are uh, homogeneous. There is no special dependence." Well, actually, this here is the transport, the, the special transport, and it's very significant. Uh, there is energy being lost to, to, to energy transport. Uh, this term here is the transport uh, uh, with the mean flow in, uh, on the stream mass direction. So, uh, of course, the, as we go down the, the, the stream mass direction, uh, the energy is, is, uh, is uh, decreasing. There's a minus here. Uh, this term here is the production term. So this is also uh, important. This term here is the interscale transfer by the mean flow. This is the mean flow. It's also important. This term here is the pressure velocity term, they're all important, yet this term here was the interscale transfer term, but the way everything is divided by, normalized by the dissipation, so the, uh, is, is actually close to one, as you would expect from Kolmogorov, but in a situation which is totally non Kolmogorov here, over a range which is between lambda, lambda is about here, lambda is the Telemarco scale, so that I told you before, it's a viscous length scale, uh, below that things are, uh, things are not, uh, turbulent in a in an initial way, and um, and over over this range, it's roughly constant, even though everything is moving up and down. If I go further downstream, eight now this interscale transfer has become constant over a long region. Now, when I say constant, of course, here is not exactly constant, and uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, perhaps in the future we we'll have to come and, and look at deviations from this constancy, but it's pretty close to constant, even though. The other terms are still uh, alive and active. This is the transport in space, so very much alive and active. This is uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the pressure velocity terms. Uh, this is now the production term uh, here, which is still present, though it has actually subsided. 
This black line here is this term here, the, the, the time derivative, the, not the time derivative, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the movement with the mean flow down, downstream. So uh, clearly it's not stationary in that sense. So very non-homogeneous, non-stationary non, non flow, and yet this relation more or less true now over a bigger range, a, a decade. And if you want to see how this term, so now I'm talking only about the interscale transfer term, and again, I remind you, this A here means I have averaged over the angles in the plane, uh, 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 evolves from X1 over D2, 4, 6, 8. 2, 4, 6, 8 is eventually leads there, but uh, very close at 2 already, you have something which is roughly constant. There is something here which, frankly, I, I, unfortunately, I will not be able to explain to you today, but there is, there is something here which is happening, and which is well beyond Komogorov, but gives Komogorov type behavior. So we also now looked at the triple decomposition to go deeper into this problem. So rather than say that I have my mean flow plus fluctuations, I moved to decomposing the fluctuations to a coherent fluctuation and a stochastic one. And this was based on the fact that this, this particular flow, and of course this may not happen in, in, every, in every flow, I, the, the lift the coefficient was following a pretty close sinusoid, and therefore it is, a, it is possible to extract a phase and here is how the lift coefficient uh, behaves uh, in terms of this phase uh, uh, after having been extracted. And this is how the drag behaves. Uh, the drag having, of course, uh, double the frequency for, for obvious reasons uh, to do with uh, the symmetry. Uh, so on the basis of this kind of phase extraction, we uh, calculated the uh, part of the fluctuating velocity field, which is coherent, and here it is. This is for one particular phase. So uh, what we plot here is the uh, intensity of the uh, velocity of the velocity of the uh, of the coherent uh, flow. So you see that uh, you know it's a bit like a common street in the sense that uh, this is below the uh, slightly below the center line to the above, slightly below, and so forth. Uh, and if you uh, look at this and remove it to obtain just the fluctuating velocity, well, the spectra change only by removing this bit here. So these are the spectra both of the fluctuating velocity as a whole, uh, which would be this with that little bit, and the fluctuating velocity only stochastic, which will be the same without this. So in some sense, we have captured the right state, if you like. So uh, just also give you a, an idea, some background, the, uh, the kinetic energy is the decaying, and, but there's a lot of kinetic energy in, the, in, this, in this coherent motion. So it's not that they are, they are weak, um, although at around eight, uh, the kinetic energy of the fluctuations becomes comparable. So now I'm using the equation like before, but now at the very beginning of this talk, it was written without any decomposition, any average. Then I used it for mean flow plus fluctuations, uh, Reynolds. Now I use it in terms of a triple decomposition, mean flow plus coherent fluctuations plus incoherent fluctuations. Uh, the equations were, was uh, first uh, derived by Fabian Thiessé, uh, Danaila, and Antonia in this paper about six years ago, uh, though they didn't have these terms here. Um, which are there because I, we also take into account and we look at delta ui, so the difference of mean flow at the different points. So let's go through this uh, enormous equation. I mean, it's, it's too many terms. It looks like, uh, you know, it's impossible to read, but actually when you put words into it, uh, the physics are pretty uh, well known. This is uh, the average mean flow just advecting downstream uh, the uh, energy of the fluctuating of the fluctuating velocity field in length scales smaller than r. Um, this, uh, this is uh, the, uh, in conservative form again, the divergence of the flux uh, uh, of uh, interscale transfer for the fluctuating velocity, the, the, uh, the, the stochastic one. This is now uh, stochastic energy being cascaded by coherent energy, coherent velocities. This is now stochastic energy being cascaded by mean flow velocities. These two terms here are actually quite important. They are the production of uh, stochastic energy by, uh, by the mean flow. And here, actually, this one is, sorry, this one is even more important, actually, this one too. This is now production of stochastic energy, this one too here, by coherent uh, flow, by the coherent flow. So this will turn out to be actually more important for, the, for, for U prime than these two. Uh, this uh, is now uh, transport in, uh, in space. 
Uh, I seem to have made a mistake and wrote, and wrote it down twice, sorry. No, 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 I didn't write it down twice. This is transport of, uh, of uh, stochastic energy by coherent motions. And this is transport of stochastic energy by stochastic motions. And this is the pressure velocity term, the two diffusion terms, and the dissipation of the two points we are looking at, the two points we use to probe the flow. So delta Q prime is the energy only in the stochastic part of the, of the, of the, of the flow. And here is what we get. And I realized I forgot to uh, explain what the lines are. I hope I remember. Uh, this line here is the term which expresses transport of uh, fluctuating stochastic energy by coherent motions. It's very important. It's actually clearly uh, an important term. This term here is production of uh, incoherent turbulence by coherent motions. Uh, it turns out, and uh, I may not have the time to talk about this, I don't think I will have the time, I haven't prepared for it anyway, that uh, energy goes from the mean flow to the, to the coherent motions and from the coherent motions to the stochastic ones. This black line here is the, uh, um, the, uh, the change of the energy uh, advected by the mean flow downstream. So a lot is more or less happening. This is pressure velocity terms. And here is the interscale transfer, which now is not constant. But now this is the interscale transfer only for the stochastic terms. We have removed the coherent terms. With the coherent terms, it was actually constant for a while. I think it was two. At eight, it again becomes constant, but this is now the term for only the stochastic. So it's, this is stochastic energy being, being cascaded by stochastic velocity fluctuations. And it's actually smaller than what you have if you take into account the coherent ones. And again, even though it's constant, you have a lot of other things happening you have transport of uh, incoherent motions by coherent ones being important. You have this, uh, uh, this um, effectively uh, non-stationarity term. You have pressure velocity term. This is the production term, the production uh, by coherent motions. So they're all, again, important, yet you have this constancy here. So uh, this little puzzle remains at uh, x1 over d equals 8. And here, it is, uh, now I return to look at this uh, back to the interscale transfer of the whole fluctuating velocity, not only the coherent or the incoherent one. And uh, here you show that at x1 over d equals 2, it is indeed roughly equal to, uh, to dissipation. These are normalized with dissipation. That's why we are roughly equal to 1. But to become this, it requires also this term here. So let me say a few things about these two terms. So this term here, basically this one, is interscale transfer of the full turbulent kinetic energy by fluctuating ones only. And that one accounts for so much of the whole interscale transfer of fluctuating energy. This term here is interscale transfer of fluctuating incoherent energy by coherent velocity fluctuations. And they actually help to bring it closer to one and closer to a constant. And actually, when you go further, further away, you can see the differences. Uh, so, uh, Again, the importance here for this constancy and this closeness to a pi participation of the coherent motions are at least on two accounts. Here is, uh, here is the same thing, but at x1 over d equals 8. And uh, this is the interscale transfer, this green line here, which is indeed equal to the, term of this, the sum of these two terms. One term is just the... Uh, the uh, the uh, stochastic fluctuations cascading down the scales, uh, full fluctuations of energy. And this one is uh, the term where coherent fluctuations cascade uh, incoherent fluctuations of energy. They behave as if actually they, uh, they contribute to an inverse cascade. But they are important to keep things constant over the region where we, see, we saw the interstate transfer being constant before. Sorry, I realize the time is, is pressing, so I'm sorry. Um, one, a few last slides. So in homogeneity is everywhere in these equations, but it's even present inside the very interscale transfer itself. It's d by dr i's, it's a divergence of the uh, velocity difference of the times delta q squared. But if you look at this delta u i times delta q squared, it has all these terms. If you are in homogeneous, you could have, of course, this being different and being different for, in different ways for different r. The derivative with respect to r could actually, this term could be non-zero simply because of inhomogeneities. 
So this term is not purely cascade, or at least I'm not quite sure how to say this because I'm still not fully cleared in my mind, to be honest with you. But there is a term in this, in this interscale transfer term which comes from inhomogeneity. So of course, this term has to be zero at r equals zero. And therefore, I seek on decomposition of these terms into two terms. One is an inhomogeneity term, inhomogeneity term, which is zero in homogeneous turbulence. So it has to be something like d by dx of something. And another term, which is non-zero in homogeneous turbulence, and both of them should be zero at r equals zero. And this is what we find. It is not a unique decomposition, but it is unique if you average over the angles of the orientations that as I showed you before. In that respect, it is unique. And there's some pretty uh, natural assumptions you can shoot mathematically. Um, uh, uh, I may ask, uh, if, you, if you ask, let me tell you. Uh, so this in this case transfer rate is therefore equal to this term here, which is what I call the inhomogeneity part of the interscale transfer. And this term here, which is what I call the homogeneity part, in homogeneous turbulence, I will only be left with this one, which directly has the correlation between the velocity of the two points. That's the velocity the fluctuation at point x centroid plus r over two, and the velocity fluctuations at x minus r over two. And this inhomogeneity term, of course, is zero if, 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 I'm, if I'm homogeneous, but it's not zero if I'm not. So the question is, how much of the pi that, that, that is, uh, I had, which is constant, appears to be constant in this very homogeneous region of the flow, is caused by the inhomogeneity. It is a transfer, you want to put it this way, or the homogeneity one. And here are the results. This is at x1 over d equals 2. This is the result I showed you before. So we are roughly constant from about lambda to 0.3d. If the inhomogeneity term wasn't present, I would have something which would go like that. So it would uh, be less constant than otherwise. So the inhomogeneity is actually helping my discrete transfer to appear constant and even, and in fact, close to, uh, to dissipation. And if I go to x1 over d equals 8, where, I, where the red line is the right line I showed you before, which is constant for a long, a long way, it would not at all be constant. I would actually have the homogeneity term would actually be uh, uh, increasing above dissipation uh, for a while if it wasn't for the correcting action uh, of the inhomogeneity term here. So this inhomogeneity term is important not, in, so inhomogeneity is not only important in all the processes that are happening at the same time. It's also important in the very, cascade term itself uh, and in bringing, in bringing it to be equal to dissipation. So this is my conclusion from the third part of my talk. And uh, the conclusion is that we have an approximate balance. So it is approximate that this orientation average interscale transfer rate of the fluctuating velocities is roughly equal to dissipation. And this is observed in this uh, turbulent wakes, planar wakes, very homogeneous near field. By the way, uh, we have saw something similar in an earlier work uh, in a PIV experiment in a near field grid turbulence. Only the PIV was uh, planar with two components. So uh, it wasn't as convincing as now because we had only some of the derivatives that define this thing. So even if this equality is reminiscent of a cosmographic equilibrium for homogeneous turbulence, it actually would not have been possible over the range of scales where it appears without the homogeneity and without the coherent structures. So with this scaling here of the dissipation, which we know exists now for a number of uh, flows uh, and which characterizes non-equilibrium or non-stationary cascades. And now this kind of balance, uh, which appears in the very non-homogeneous near field turbulence, I feel that actually the study of turbulent cascades um, and the turbulence physics of dissipation in non-homogeneous, non non-stationary turbulence is a not a no man's land. And uh, I think that uh, it is worth doing research in, in there, obviously that's why I'm working on this, because we have, there are some clear results which appear. Um, sorry, I think it's already four o'clock. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for uh, your patience. And uh, uh, I'm ready to take questions. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Christo. For, uh, should I remove this or should I do it? Well, maybe leave it. We leave it? Questions, yeah. What can you see now, by the way? We can see the, we can see two slides, but that's okay. You can leave it as that. Um, so, 
do we, yeah, now we're back to the full screen. Ah, so do yeah, we yeah, yeah, yeah. have any questions for Christos? Uh, please either unmute yourselves or put them in the chat. One, so uh, okay. can can I let me try with with something? I mean, I'm, clearly, I'm nowhere near uh, in a position to to follow turbulence. Um, but the, well, let me see you anyway. <laughs> the, um, the 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 type of theory you you develop. Do you, do you think it would um, it would also occur for simpler model equations that that give kind of uh, turbulent type flows and um, systems kind of inertial manifold type equations. So the, no, the, the cascade is basically an effect of the nonlinearity. Mm -hmm. Of course, here we have nonlinearity and the pressure term as well. So we yeah. have both nonlinearity. But I guess wherever you have nonlinearity, you could have a cascade like this. You should be able to write an equation of this sort, if this is what, is what we're asking. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of... Yeah, go. Yeah, I'm just thinking it may be much easier to simulate. Uh, you can do it. Yes, lot. yes, absolutely. One, it, it could be, uh, people have looked at things like the Burgess equation, which of course is a, creates shocks, and in some sense is perhaps that's why I mentioned non-locality before. Uh, people have been looking at sim, at other simpler equations, as, as it were. But here, of course, I'm putting the emphasis on inhomogeneity and you know not nationality, as it were. So I'm saying that it's very important to look at that. Even when you look at homogeneous turbulence, the fluctuations are such and they correlate in such a way that you cannot neglect the inhomogeneity within the homogeneous turbulence. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, John. John, yes. Um, I was intrigued by one of your statements near the beginning of your talk where I may have had it wrong that something like 50% of the energy came from came from events that had a very, very low probability. Yes, not the energy, the interscale transfer rate. So can you see my cursor? Yes. So this is the average interscale transfer rate, right? Right. Average over realizations and also little a over over a sphere of, so I can have a function of only R, not of the yeah. directions of R. If you remove all the events below this red line, if you remove all these events here, then you have half of it. Right. I'm not saying this is something that wasn't known before. I think that this was, I think that since the early nineties work of Piomelli in channel flow and the work by uh, people like, um, uh, oh, forget this name, uh, Polish name. Uh, sorry. Uh, they had seen that you have actually both the forward and inverse cascades as well, like this, and they had seen that you have uh, extreme events of cascade. That was, it's, I'm not saying that this was my own new result, but it is striking and it's good to know. Yes, I, it was the references. I, I would like to look this up. Ah, Domorowski. Sorry, I have a reference there. Domorowski. Okay. Thank you. But as I was also said later on in my presentation, you know, the 96 equations can easily show you that you cannot have inverse cascade without forward cascade at the same time. They must coexist. They must coexist. May I ask a quick question? Yes, Yongo. Yes, yeah, so the very last slide, the very, I'm slightly confused about the statement in the very last slide. Sure, I, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Just, just I mean, yeah. Just enlighten me you know, if I'm wrong. If I don't understand things. You know, this the C epsilon, which is a function of the the, uh, the also integral I mean, scale Reynolds number, and uh, which is actually I, I understood this is some sort of you know kind of you know evidence of non equilibrium you know cascade, and then the the, the next sentence you say it actually phi a is roughly same as minus C epsilon. Uh, if you have a non-equilibrium cascade, actually that statement seems to be contradictory to each other. I, I mean, this is my just first, first uh, the, I mean, just correct me if I'm yes. wrong. Yes, you're right, Yong Yong. You're right. 
And this was the point of my talk, and I, I probably went too quickly to my talk, and I apologize. Yeah. But basically, the point of my talk was that in a very homogeneous situation, yes. like the one we have very close to a bar, plane yeah. away, you can still find this Kolmogorov looking balance, but not for Kolmogorov reasons. That actually, to obtain this balance, you, the, the homogeneity contributes in more than one way. The coherence contributes as well, and the, so, and the non-stationarity as well. Ah, I see. So, you see? Yes, yeah, so but then, then the next question that I had was actually, the, you show that lots of data actually using the Kármán Howarth equation. And then the difficulty I had actually, whenever I tried to use this sort of the, actually the energy balance or scale balance whatsoever was, that you can actually study the, the energy transfer rate, you know, you know, back and forth whatsoever, but actually you can't really see the what kind of dynamics actually going on behind actually within the flow field. You see what I mean? Uh, I see what you mean, but that's why I looked everything in terms of physical space, and that's why I interpreted the cascade in terms of stretching and compression. Mm -hmm. And that is, in terms of fluid mechanics, a very clear thing. I mean, there was, for instance, was, it, was, excuse me. Yeah, is there any kind of coherent actually vortex dynamics related to the compression and stretching event, or um, just the? Of course, there must be. There must be. I'm not saying yeah. that I was able to to show it to you and go and see it, but there must be. Clearly, this compression and stretching have to do with uh, with the vortex stretching, with uh, the strain of amplification, all these things. Yes. I see. Yes. Okay. I'm just, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Uh, uh, I'm uh, also work, uh, working with uh, Kamahau, the question with Papa, uh, Josh Papadakis. Um, so my question is, uh, in the last part, what, why, why did you normalize each terms uh, with dissipation? Is there any particular reason? Yes, because I was preparing myself for the result that yeah. The integral transfer rate would be roughly equal to dissipation or to minus dissipation. So I was. So is the constant? So for example, here you yeah. see it's close to minus one. Therefore, they balance each other. That's why I I I I, I normalize by this. Okay. Um, also, it's, you, the only, yeah. it's the only term in the equation which is the sum of two terms. All the others are differences. So when you take r equals to zero, it doesn't go to zero that term. Okay. Okay. Have you tried to hold the equation in boundary layers or something like that? Because I'm trying to like normalize with dissipation as well in my case, because I'm, I'm working on boundary layer case, but it's going to be a mess with uh, this kind of normalization. So what, what do you suggest if... Uh, is... uh, we, are, we are trying. You're we are trying. trying. But there's too many clever people listening right now, so I won't say what we're doing. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. Uh, okay, uh, another a general question is the, I also discussed with the Yong Yun because he's my uh, reviewer with this, this kind of work. So, um, so come how the equation is supposed to be general, right? For any cases, it's basically in uh, the best equation. The common Howard Morning Hill equation. Yes, yeah. that is, uh, yeah. Was, uh, no, was, okay, that yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all it is. Okay, is there, it, does it make sense to working on, say, bypass transition flow or sort of laminar flow case, even though it is laminar flow, but there's actually streaks or fluctuation inside. Does that make sense to do this kind of uh, calculation for like any kind of flow? This comes back to the question of Dimitris, if you can apply this to uh, other, other situations. And I would say whenever you have a nonlinearity, perhaps it is useful. Uh, I'm not enough of an expert, and there are, I think there are enough experts in the audience on, on transition that could uh, give a better, good reason for why it could be useful. But I, I don't see any reason why it couldn't. Okay, okay. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Any, <clears throat> any other questions? Uh, hello? Um, oh, Henry. Hi, hi. Um, I just um, noticed on your um, 
uh, on your slides on the, um, the behind the, the square prism, you had the minus five third um, uh, scaling of the frequency spectra. Um, and one possible uh, explanation for that could be sweeping. Um, actually, because that's the same um, scaling that um, Tenecus gets his uh, sweeping, uh, sweeping prediction. Um, but then it's in a different context than he differently proposed it. So Tenecus does this uh, argument for inhomogeneous turbulence. Uh, in fact, inhomogeneous stationary turbulence, when you can actually assume you have a Kolmogorov spectrum for the wave number. And then indeed you can make an assumption about sweeping, which is basically relating frequencies to wave numbers by the RMS of the turbulence, and that would give five thirds. But here we do not have the conditions of, of, of Tenekes. We do not have a, a Kolmogorov homogeneous stationary situation. No, but if you still have a situation where you have a moment of fluctuations, the situation where uh, the large scales um, affect the small scales, you, you can still, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we can take this another time. Uh, but there is no, you have to explain why what you advect is, is in some sense, because this is not homogeneous, right? Some sense minus five thousand wave number over, over all these decade of scales. Uh, yeah. In fact, this five thirds you can find very, very close to the bars uh, where the shear layer becomes unstable. Okay, yeah. By the way. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any any other questions for, for Christos? No. By the way, Henrik is the person who is working in your department on mm. uh, the first part of my talk, I didn't, which I said I didn't mm. say much about. Uh, so anyway. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully in some... Uh... In some time, we can add a bit more detail to those slides, uh, explain them. Okay. okay, any other questions? Otherwise, we'll bring the talk to an end. Uh, and uh, please join me in thanking Christos for, uh, for a, a fascinating talk, really. Uh, very, very interesting. And yeah, thank you, Christos. Yeah. Thank you, Sergei. Always a pleasure to see you. Let me stop recording. Thank you.